Great. Well, uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Derek Scasta. I'm an associate professor and extension rangeland specialist here at the University of Wyoming. And today I'm going to talk about horn fly and management for Wyoming cattle. So horn flies, uh, as you can see here, are a uh, fly parasite of cattle that are not native to the United States. Uh, they were brought in when cattle were imported. Um, they're blood feeders, and they're also known as filth flies or dung-dependent flies because they lay their eggs in cow dung, in those uh, cow pies. They have about a 10 to 20-day life cycle from the time they lay an egg to the time a new generation of adults emerges and starts to seek out a host cow uh, or, or bovine. They have a high preference for cattle, although they've been found on bison and a few other bovids. Um, and they are known to overwinter either in or directly below those fecal pies, uh, that fecal material. And that's important for maybe some innovative ways to think about how to manage these parasites. So here's just a, a cow with a pretty high infestation of horn flies, just to give you kind of a visual appreciation of what we're talking about. Uh, the name horn does suggest that they do congregate around the, the horn or the pole of the cow, um, which they do, but they also spend a lot of time on the back. Uh, and on the sides of cattle. And here we've zoomed in a little bit and you can see these flies have a really unique orientation where they always uh, rest on the animal when they're feeding with their head down and their wings up. And that is a way you can identify them uh, from other fly parasite species and there are others. When we talk about horn flies, we need to understand their life cycle and then how we disrupt that life cycle to manage those. So the adult flies uh, stay on uh, cattle for about 24 hours a day, um, only leaving to deposit eggs in the manure. Um, when they leave the cow, they will lay eggs in fresh manure and then quickly return to the host. Those eggs hatch in those cow pies in one to two days. They grow in there because it's a resource rich environment. And then they change into what we call a pupae in the manure. And then ultimately they emerge and they fly around and seek out another uh, cow to feed on and, and take blood meals from. So we can disrupt this relationship at different places along this life cycle. We can do things to the host. We can do things to the flies when they're on the animal. We can do things to the larvae when they're in the cow pies. We can do things when they're starting to emerge from those cow pies. And then we can also do things when they're seeking a host. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of strategies that capitalize on all these uh, different places in the life cycle of a horn fly. So you can see they're, they're pretty well e equipped uh, with this pretty prominent proboscis here to penetrate the hide and access blood of cattle. And uh, so as a biting fly, they cause a lot of irritation and ultimately a lot of production losses. So when an animal is infested with horn flies, their productivity is reduced because those flies are consuming a lot of blood meals. They're also really irritating the animal, so it reduces the animal's grazing time because those cattle are doing all these annoyance avoidance behaviors. They're swinging their head. Uh, they have that paniculous reflex where they're shaking their hide. Um, they're stomping their feet. They're switching their tail. All those behaviors reduce their energy time and they have an energy cost. So ultimately it can affect animal productivity. And this costs the US cattle industry quite a bit of money, uh, estimated to be over a billion dollars a year in production losses. Some of the production losses you might think of are reductions in milk production in those uh, production females, but also uh, calf gains uh, that are um, on the, the female. Winning weights can be reduced anywhere from 4 to 15 percent. For yearling cattle or, or growth cattle, stalker cattle, total gains can be reduced up to 18 percent uh, when they're infested with horn flies. So big problem that producers want to pay attention to. In terms of blood loss, their average, average blood mills is about one and a half milligrams. Each fly takes anywhere from 24 to 38 mils per day. And ultimately, this leads to a substantial reduction in blood content. And physiologically, that's, a, that's not a, a positive situation for an animal. So here's a bunch of studies uh, from around the country, from the Great Plains up into um, Canada even. And you can see for calves uh, and weaning weights or yearling cattle gains, um, no matter the type of treatment, uh, there was an increase in weight. And so treatment can uh, pay off at certain levels, and we'll talk about those thresholds. But I just want to show you there's a lot of research uh, that has shown treatment can pay, particularly when animals are infested at a high level. 
So there's calf weaning weights, and there's your lean cattle gains. There's also an effective elevation. And so we used to have a livestock entomologist here at University of Wyoming named John Lloyd. And he did this elevation study in Wyoming and Nebraska. And he looked at three elevations, cattle at three elevations, 2,600 feet, about 6,000 feet, and almost 8,000 feet. And cattle on the high elevation ranch always had the fewest horn flies. And so as elevation increased, horn fly numbers decreased because those high elevations are colder environments. The summers are shorter. There's less generations uh, of flies. But if we're moving into, let's say, a, a warming climate, even just a degree or two, this might um, change how elevation plays a, a role in uh, Wyoming. And so I just think it's something to be aware of. So I'm going to talk about integrated pest management or IPM. This includes these kind of six strategies. So long-term prevention, monitoring, correct pest identification, management when needed, trying to prevent pest problems, and then combining tools, right? Using different strategies in an integrated way. But the seventh is managing for economic thresholds, understanding when an animal is so infested that now treatment will pay off. The cost of that treatment uh, will pay off in terms of reducing those losses. So for horn flies on cattle, this economic threshold, which we'll say is the pest or injury level when the value of loss exceeds the cost of control, is estimated to be around 200 flies per cow or just 100 uh, flies per cow side. Oftentimes when we do research on cows and horn flies, we may only take a picture of one side of the cow and we assume, well, if we see 100 on one side, there's probably 100, another 100 on the other side. And so that cow may have 200 horn flies per cow. So I want you to keep that number in mind because we're going to look at some cattle today and we're going to visually estimate their infestation levels. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's get calibrated. How many flies do you estimate on this cow here? This is a cow um, here in, in near Laramie. Give you just a second there. So you can see all these little dots here. Again, head down, wings up. So this cow's got about 50 um, in this picture. So we figure she's probably got around 100. So she's below the threshold for treatment. Here's another cow. Again, you can see uh, horn flies along the, the back and this side up here on the shoulder. So if we estimate her, she's got about 75 in the image there. So she's probably got about 150 on both sides. So again, she's still below that treatment threshold. So here's another cow, a few more flies here. And as you're looking at that, the way we do research on these, we actually count these flies in digital images. So I've counted all these images. Think about how many she might have. So she's got around 125 when you zoom in. So she's probably around that threshold then of 200, 250 horn flies. So we might start thinking about treatment now when we start to see uh, females in the herd that look like her. Here's another one. Again, she's got a few more flies. Y'all can kind of see where I'm going with this. So I counted her. She's got 150 uh, in that picture. So she's probably over 300. Now here's another uh, cow. And one of the things probably a lot of you know is that uh, as the heat of the day starts to express itself, these flies will move from the top line and the sides down to the, the belly to try to get out of that direct sunlight. They're trying to regulate their thermal environment. This cow here, she's got about 190 just in that picture. So she's well over the threshold. Here's another, another cow. If we were to count those, she's around 290. So she'd probably be uh, approaching 600 in total if we could count both sides. So here's a, a female, quite a lot. She think about how many she might have. I'll tell you, she's got over 500, okay? So she's certainly uh, a candidate for treatment. Now, let's just zoom in because it can be a little misleading. You might look at that picture and say, well, there's no way she has 500 flies. So I'll zoom into this red box here. Okay, there's that. And I'm going to put a red dot on every fly in that picture. So there you go. I've overlaid those. In that picture... Um, that's exactly 100 red dots, and that still doesn't account for all the flies in that picture. You'll see over here to the right, we've got a, a handful of flies. So she's probably got 130 or so flies just in that one image. So if we back out and we think about that one part of her, and we start to multiply that around, 
right, we can we can get to that number pretty quickly. So it can be a little bit deceiving because they're so small. So, and of course, we do not want to get into situations like this. This is a, a beef cow um, that has over a thousand. So, so let's talk about four management strategies. The first is animal rotation. The second is breed selection. The third is selecting for heritability of resistance. The fourth is chemical control. And I'm going to get into the details on all of these and give you some, some thoughts and ideas. So in terms of rotation and habitat manipulation, not much has been done. Um, the only study really that's ever come out is this here at the bottom, which is the evaluation of alternative tactics for management of insecticide resistant hornflies. One of the problems with hornflies is they can become resistant to the chemicals that we use. And so we need to think about make, making sure, number one, we're judicious with chemicals, but number two, we're integrating strategies. And what they found here was when they rotated through these three to eight acre paddocks, it didn't matter. It did not affect horn flies. Now, conceptually, this might be a good strategy because you might get ahead of the life cycle. You might leave all those larvae in the fecal pies behind if you can get far enough away. And that might include last year's population that have overwintered in those areas or even current year's generations. But there's a real lack of data on this, particularly if we make much larger movements. Certainly flies can, uh, can travel quite a distance, but bigger rotations really might be a way to, to manipulate some of this. There is some evidence that habitat manipulation um, can alter the effects of tick infestation on cattle, and there is a little bit for flies. So this is a study in some areas that had been burned. Uh, two studies, one in Iowa, one in Oklahoma. And I'll just point out that the white bars were areas that had had some fire in the pastures, and the gray bars were areas without any fire. And you can see that the hornfly numbers were about half where there had been some fire. So it disrupted some habitat, probably disrupted some of those fecal pies, uh, maybe moved animals around. They were maybe grazing in areas that had burned. So that can be effective. We need some more research in this area. The second is breed selection. So parasites, they, they discriminate. They discriminate based on breed, sex, age, uh, wool type. So medium wool versus fine wool. We've shown that in sheep keds or sheep ticks. Uh, hair, so follicle density, uh, color of hair, and then that hide environment, also thickness of the hide. So all these parasites, as they're out there in the environment trying to find a suitable host, you know, they, they are looking across a bunch of different animals, and they are discriminating, and we can use that to our advantage potentially. So strategically, you could do a couple of things. You could, one, treat susceptible animals, so just a subset of animals in the herd that are susceptible. Two, you could select <clears throat> animals that recently you have noticed were more resistant uh, to those flies for whatever reason. And let me show you a study that we did where we had some co-mingled uh, white Charlay and black Angus cows. This occurred just outside of Laramie. Uh, we published this paper. I'd be happy to share this with anybody. Uh, so co-mingled black and white cows in high elevation rangeland are differentially parasized, parasitized by horn flies. And there's a picture of those cows, their pasture there. And so here's what we found. In 2016 and 2017, the black Angus cows always had average horn fly infestations much higher than the white Charlay cows, okay? Always a significant difference. In 2016, those black cows exceeded the economic threshold. It was a little bit warmer year. In 2017, neither of the, at the herd level average exceeded the threshold. So what that means is if you've got black cattle, which in our environment have a warmer external surface environment, so we're a cold, uh, high elevation environment. They might prefer those black animals. And so you might want to pay attention. So if you've got a bunch of like uh, mixed yearlings that you brought in, you got white, red, and black cattle, right? You may only need to treat those black cattle in our environment. So this is a way you could pay attention to this. Okay, the third is the heritability of resistance and the selection for that. So this has been shown to be effective in, in managing lice for both sheep and cattle. There's a number of ranchers that are really integrating this in their selection and culling criteria. So you can think about all the criteria you, you use to cull a cow, right? She's open. She's got bad udders. Uh, she's got bad feet. She's got a bad eye. 
She's she's old. Uh, Kit Farrow down in Colorado, he's been also selecting for animals that are less infested with horn flies. And uh, the evidence he's seen in his own program is fewer problems with horn flies. Um, now, why this may happen, we, we don't exactly know. There is one study that shows the accessibility of blood affects the attractiveness of cattle to horn flies. And what they got at there was the thickness of the skin, was what was playing into why some animals were more parasitized than others. So thinking about selection and culling and how you uh, manage that could play into your parasite management program. There's some other work that's international that has shown this. Uh, this is a study from Australia um, that showed uh, over time that they could um, select for tick and intestinal worm resistance. Um, and they were selecting primarily for tick resistance. They report in the study that as they were selecting for those, there was also some potential for horn fly resistance. Some places they'll call these buffalo flies. It's the same uh, scientific name though. So there's some evidence from other countries. So here's kind of this animal resistance concept. And this is what I call the case of 2303 and 7682. So these are two companion cows, same herd, same pasture, same environment, uh, and a series of weeks in 2016, okay? So we'll start with 2303. So you can see the herd average for five weeks that we sampled. And I'm going to put up 2303 and where she falls out relative to the herd average. So week one, she had 40. The herd average was about 70. Week two, she had about 46. Herd average was 123. Week three, 120. Herd average was 220. Week four, the herd average was 80. She had about 34. Week five, she had about 34. So every week she was below the average. So she might be a cow that maybe has some more resistance to horde flies for some, some reason. So we might call her resistant. Now here's this other cow and we'll do the same thing and look at each of these weekly counts. So week one, um, she had about two times the amount of flies as the herd average. Week two, she was higher than the herd average. And you kind of get the point here, right? She was always an individual that had higher numbers of horn flies than the average of the herd. And so she might be a cow that we say is susceptible for whatever reason. So maybe if we're having to make some culling decisions, this might be another individual that we say, okay, we're going to go ahead and ship her and we're going to retain uh, this cow. This is the cow that was consistently lower than the herd average. And of course, she's probably got some hide and coat features that are playing into this. Um, but this is something I just want to show you that that you can observe through time. And certainly producers have seen this in their own observations. So the fourth is chemical control. And there's a lot of tools. Um, some of these have been around for a really long time. I'll just point out Corral, which is a, a chemical that's been around for, for many decades, uh, still out there. Um, a lot of these have different delivery methods. So some of these are porons, some are back rubbers and oilers. My father-in-law still likes to use back rubbers some years. Some are direct animal application. Some are dust bags. Some are ear tags, and that's certainly um, gained in popularity over the years. Um, and then we have these uh, fed-through products or IGRs. I certainly know some of some producers in the state of Wyoming who were using these. And then there's this compressed air gun application I'll mention really quickly. So in terms of these chemical control options, back rubbers and dust bags are effective if you can force those cattle to go under and rub on those. So if you've got a watering point with a, a gate or some way you can um, constrict their movement through there um, and put those there, that could work. If you don't, it may not work. The second are ear tags. Um, ear tags can be effective. One of the problems is that these flies can develop resistance to the class of chemicals we call pyrethroids. So if you're going to use ear tags, you need to make sure you rotate products from year to year and that you remove those old tags in the fall. You don't want those to stay in there over the winter because they may have a really low level of the chemical on it. The third is sprays and porons. Um, one of the things about these that you want to note is these are not season long. These are maybe uh, one to three weeks worth of control. So you're going to have to reapply through the season. And then we have the oral or the fed through. These typically kill the larvae in the manure. And what you want to um, achieve here is what we would say is steady consumption. 
um, is required in order to mitigate problems if it's going to be effective. So here's a cost comparison, and I borrowed this from a colleague at Oklahoma State. Um, you can see um, on the left the type of products. We have ear tags, pour-on sprays, and then this vet gun application. The next column is how long the treatment lasts. So ear tags will last 12 to 20 weeks, pour-ons and sprays maybe only three to four weeks. Then you can look at the cost per treatment per head, but what you really want to pay attention to is here at the last column, the total cost per head over the horn fly season, over that summer season. And ear tags um, and some of the pour-ons may be some of the cheaper options uh, for you to consider. Um, so here's a really good website if this is something that you're interested in, livestockbugs.okstate.edu, uh, hornfly slash insecticide ear tags. So Justin Talley is a livestock entomologist there, and he's really evaluating these products more than, than I'm able to. Um, and you can just see these are kind of grouped in different classes of chemicals. So at the top, you can see the organophosphate products, in the middle, the pyrethroid products, and in the bottom is the macrocyclic lactones. And what you'd want to do is maybe select one from the organophosphates one year, and then the next year select something from the pyrethroids. So you're not using the same class of chemical year in and year out. Uh, this is just some data from Nebraska, which has a good horn fly uh, research program too, uh, where they looked at ear tags against horn fly numbers. And uh, you can see the blues were these treatments with XP820 tags, um, and they had like a 90% reduction for several years, uh, six years in this study. Again, um, this is from Alfalfa County, uh, Oklahoma, um, and you can see some similar results. This orange line is the control. You can see it's higher in May and June, um, but what you see here is you start to see some of these products breaking down later in the year. So the chemical starts to wear off of those ear tags, and uh, its control um, lessens later in the year, and you can see a lot of these approach levels similar to the untreated cattle. So you want to make sure you manage chemical resistance. The resistance of pyrethroids on horn flies over a three-year period has been shown. So where they were getting 20 weeks of uh, effectiveness the first year, by the third year, those tags were only effective for about a week. So you want to rotate through insecticides or only treat if conditions deem appropriate. And in Wyoming, some years are worse than others, like I showed you with those Charlay and Black Angus cows we evaluated here in Laramie. Um, here's an example of a rotation. So year one, you might use a macrocyclic lactone, year two, an organophosphate, and then year three, a synthetic pyrethroid. And then you'd come back to the macrocyclic lactone um, in year four. There's those fed through products, as I mentioned. Um, these are oral larvicides and insect growth regulators or IGRs. Um, there's several manufacturers of these. Um, just to give you an example of what you might get, um, here's Raybon 7.76. It's a pre-mixed product. Um, and here's kind of how these things work <clears throat> um, in terms of getting them fed through the animal. Steady consumption is necessary. One thing to remember with these or any product is if you're managing your parasite problem, these flies can migrate. They can travel from your neighbors. So sometimes you might be on top of it, but your problems may be coming from a from your neighbors or somewhere else. There's also this vet gun delivery method. Uh, this has been around for a number of years. This applies an individual uh, insecticide capsule to the animal, kind of like a paintball gun, if you're familiar with that. Um, control's been said to be 21 to 35 days. Of course, there's a lot of questions about, you know, shooting cattle with this. Is it gonna make them more flighty, harder to gather, some of those things, but it is out there. So just to be aware of that. So my research program, because Wyoming not every year, and here in Laramie not every year is a really bad year, I'm looking at a bunch of non-chemical uh, areas, including individual animal hide and blood traits. So we're at evaluating skin thickness, also the clotting time, and then serum metabolites, which are indicators of stress, to try to understand if any of those influence why some cows are more parasitized than others. We're looking at cattle across elevations, and then we're looking at some different breed and species work. So the thing you want to remember is to keep all the tools in the toolbox ready to go. Just like you'd have a table like this set up uh, at a branding or um, fall works, your parasite management is another tool in the toolbox and use all the tools available 
to disrupt that biological cycle that we started talking about at the beginning. There's my email. If you have any questions, uh, reach out anytime. I'd sure be happy to talk to you all about uh, my research program and just brainstorm about ideas for your operations. So thank you.